technical paper session, session 4A. And uh, this is a unique session in the uh, whole uh, technical pilot tracks at VLSA Design Conference. And uh, what makes it unique, uh, uh, this name of the session, uh, which is uh, Selected Papers Special Session on Design Automation Conference. So DAC, uh, DAC has a long association with VLSA Design or uh, I could say the other way around, VLSA Design has a long association with DAC, Design Automation Conference. And that's the reason why DAC has recognized uh, VLSA Design as a sister conference. So VLSA Design um, have a you know, uh, uh, good deep footprint uh, across the globe and that's why DAC recognized VLSA D as a sister conference. So as like uh, previous year, this year again at this 35th International Conference on VLSA Design and 21st <coughs> International Conference on Embedded Systems, we are going to organize this special session on Design Automation Conference. Uh, this year, the 59th edition of DAC, Design Automation Conference, this would be held from 10th of July to 14th of July uh, in San Francisco, California, USA. And this special session is you know a way for us to bring up the more collaboration between these two prestigious conferences and herein we'll be presenting you the best papers the hand-picked best papers which were presented out of DAC to get the enriching uh, uh, knowledge experience here so without any delay let me move forward and invite uh, the first uh, session talk for today's session which is an invited talk uh, and this talk is on 59th design automation conference uh, the speaker of the talk is robert oshana uh, from nxv semiconductor so before we move forward uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome rob here he's the general chair for the 59th edition of the DAC to share his view about the DAC. So I would request Rob to be here. It's a true honor and a privilege to introduce Rob to you all today. Rob, Rob Ashana is Vice President of Software Engineering R&D for the edge processing business line at NXP Semiconductors. He is responsible for software enablement, IoT connectivity, software middleware, and security, operating systems, machine learning, software services and advanced technologies. So anything to everything to talk about Edge. He serves on multiple industry advisory boards and is recognized an international speaker globally. He has published numerous number of books, articles, papers on software engineering and embedded system. He is also an adjunct faculty, a professor at University of Texas and Southern University and he is a senior member of IEEE. So with this, let me welcome Rob here to share his view on the 59th Design Automation Conference. Over to you, Rob. Welcome everybody, this is Rob O'Shanna. I am the General Chairman for Design Automation Conference 59, DAC 59, which will be held in uh, San Francisco this July 10 through 14. I want to give you a quick update as to uh, where we are and what we're planning in for DAC 59. As you can see here, first of all, I'll start with worldwide um, IC sales growth. As you can see, we are uh, we had a very good year in 21, and we plan uh, to grow again this this year in this uh, market. So very healthy growth of 20 something percent. Uh, uh, and you've uh, all probably, um, you know, heard about some of the uh, supply issues as well. Let me go talk a little bit about that because when you look at the, uh, some of the supply issues, first of all, you can definitely see that uh, delivery times have been uh, going up pretty uh, significantly as well as prices uh, in order to, uh, those prices are being driven by uh, uh, many factors, not just um, from margin related but also in order to get the supply needed. So uh, we have supply issues and delivery times. We have prices going up. Uh, most of you have experienced this or certainly heard of it. Uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the area of you know, 
what's really being impacted by these long de delivery times. So automotive is uh, on the right hand chart clearly is is one of the top areas of uh, where we where delivery time has been impacted significantly. If you've tried to buy a car, even a used car, you've probably experienced that, but also household goods as well as technology equipment all uh, impacted by the, um, the supply uh, kind of crisis that we're going through. We're hoping 2022 will begin to ease this a little bit later this year. Uh, it'll start getting better and, and hopefully uh, back to normal before too long. But we're currently we're living in a very supply a critical uh, time. Uh, however, back in December, we did have DAC Live, DAC 58. Uh, we pushed this from July last year to December because of some of the COVID related uh, restrictions, but we did hold the live conference. And these are a couple of pictures from the conference. Uh, I think the conference went very well uh, considering uh, we imposed a number of uh, you know, safety uh, mechanisms in place for the attendees. And uh, it was a very good, very robust conference. We had a lot of great technical talks. We had uh, a lot going on in the show floor. So, so overall, uh, given that we're just coming out of COVID, I uh, was very pleased, very happy with uh, the attendees, not not like it was in kind of the good old days, but a, a good attendance. And of course, as always, uh, great technical content. So uh, this year, uh, DAC 59, again, will be held in July out in San Francisco, and uh, we're hoping to get even more back to normal. Uh, and I think it's shaping up that way. Let me give you a brief uh, overview of that. The uh, Another, you know, I have to say another great year of research uh, track submissions. You can see for, for this year, uh, we set an all-time record, uh, 987 submissions. And we're reviewing these now, uh, choosing the, the top papers to represent us this year. Uh, I think we're going to have a great uh, technical show. on The, uh, the research side, I think, is going to be very well uh, off as far as good technical content. And really looking forward to that as well. Of course, we, we also have the engineering track, uh, which used to be called the designer track. And we also have uh, some great panels, uh, some really good posters. And we're going to improve that this year with our poster gladiators, um, which is an improvement over the last uh, couple of years. And um, of course, keynotes will be um, as good as always. But very happy to see. Uh, the submissions going back up to normal and back up to where we expected them to be. And the demographics for these research paper submissions, uh, again, is, uh, is, is very healthy. Uh, uh, you can see here we, we get a lot of submissions from Asia as well as North America and EMEA, so Europe and Africa. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, uh, in my mind, a, a very good demographic that shows that, again, we're getting back to a truly a global uh, conference. And I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, the conference this year being live again with great participation from around the globe. Very happy to see the demographics uh, uh, working out really well this year. And then uh, and just to let you know, again, if you don't already know this, DAC has grown, you know, grown beyond its core uh, electric design automation roots. Uh, the design automation conference is more than just EDA. And uh, this pie chart shows that. EDA is really only 25% of the content that you'll find at DAC uh, this year. We have a lot uh, of contributions, technical contributions on the design side. Embedded systems is growing very nicely. Security has always been a key component of what we do. Of course, everyone is interested these days in uh, AI and machine learning, and uh, we're going to have a lot of really good content there, both from the cloud as well as the edge and the end node. And then autonomous systems is uh, roughly how uh, the, the pie chart is built out. Uh, underneath this, there's a lot of really good categories in design and you know, EDA and embedded, but um, the, the key message on this slide is really that 
uh, DAC is more than just EDA. It has been for quite some time, but it continues to evolve into a top technical conference, uh, global technical conference. And so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all there uh, at the conference this year. I hope hopefully that the international travel restrictions will allow people to to travel. Um, I will be there. Hope to see you all there. And uh, there's going to be some really, really good content. Um, and you'll see some other or hear some other presentations uh, some, from some of the best paper conferences from last year. And uh, I really hope that uh, you all will consider attending or submitting uh, in the future. So I do want to thank you very much for giving me your time. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of the DAC presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, uh, for such a insightful uh, you know overview about the DAC and uh, we all are excited uh, and looking forward to be in person there this time at DAC and and it's, it's you know uh, uh, great to see uh, as you mentioned that you know IC sales are skyrocketing uh, we have moved beyond the 500 billion walk mark which was you know which was a dream and uh, love that has become the reality so this is the D time for the whole semiconductor community and many congratulations to you and the DAC team to touch a big mark of 987 submission. That's really awesome. And I'm, I'm sure you're gonna move beyond thousand, uh, the mark of thousand plus in the, in the coming years. And, and, and really happy uh, to see that DAC has really expanded beyond the regular ED and automation. So topics like AI, embedded system, security, autonomous design, which is kind of 40% of your whole submission. So that, that is a great thing to see. So many congratulations. And again, thank you very much. On behalf of the conference, I thank you for sparing your precious time to come and share your insight about the DAC. And I'm sure uh, as the time comes, uh, uh, the DAC is going to go much bigger, higher mark. So with this, let me uh, move forward uh, to break forward session. And we have a very uh, special start of this special session on DAG. And why it is special, we have uh, the next paper, which was uh, rated as the best paper winner for the 58th uh, Design Automation Conference to start our session with. So let me introduce the title uh, uh, of this paper. The paper is Enabling Systematic Deep learning architects evaluating via full stack integration. So I'm I'm really excited even you know reading the title of the paper, and I could see Hassan here uh, you know uh, smiling bit of it his night uh, his time here. So let me introduce uh, and let me get uh, take this privilege to introduce uh, you know whole set of authors here. The list is little long, so kindly bear with me. So uh, this paper is authored by Hassan, uh, who's in person with us now, uh, along with Snake Kim, Alan, Amir, Vignesh, Pranav, Jerry, Daniel, Harrison, Howard, Albert, Colin, Samuel, John, Ion, Christy, Nicole, Yukon, Sophia Sahu, University of California, Berkeley. So Sophia had a, a, a invited talk as well in this conference and good to see uh, she's one of the authors for the paper as well. And the, and the list doesn't stop here. We have another author, uh, Jonathan from Manager, uh, Manchester Institute of Technology, Cambridge. So a good set of uh, authors for a well-deserved best paper award. So with that, uh, Let's get started with our first paper for the day, uh, which is paper 4.a.1. Over to you, team, uh, to get started with the first presentation of the day. Hi, my name is Hassan Genj, and I'll be presenting our work on the Gemini project, which is a platform for full system, full stack DNN hardware evaluation and exploration. I'll be explaining what Gemini is and how it enables architects to make useful insights into the impact that different system components have upon DNN acceleration. Now, it won't come as a surprise to any of you to hear that DNNs are becoming very popular and people are trying to get them running on everything from drones in the sky, to cars on the street, to 
the phones in your pocket. Unfortunately, these DNNs have very high computational requirements, which means that DNN accelerators have to be designed to actually run these workloads in an efficient manner. So these DNN accelerators are also being put into everything from small edge devices to power hungry cars to huge cloud warehouses. However, designing new hardware accelerators is a very difficult, expensive, and time-consuming task. But every new physical environment imposes its own resource constraints, which means that many different types of accelerators are needed for different environments and the different edge products are constantly being churned out by industry. And that means that accelerator generators are also exploding in popularity. These generators allow architects to change a few parameters or maybe a few lines of a DSL or configuration file and develop a new accelerator for a new environment at little extra cost. Existing generators each push forward the state of the art in different and important ways, but they don't give architects all the tools they need to evaluate the impact of the full system and the full stack on performance and the ability to see how different components of the system and software stack may interact with the accelerator itself. Now, when we discuss the full system, what do we mean exactly and why is it important? Well, the system, as we use the term, encompasses everything from the SOC all the way up to the operating system running on the SOC. The actual physical SOC can greatly reduce the maximum performance of the accelerator if its resources have not been well distributed among competing components. If we zoom in past the SOC itself, the memory hierarchy, not just of the accelerator's private scratch pad, but also of other CPUs and shared outer caches can impact overall performance, either in subtle ways, such as through cache coherence policies, or much more directly through miss rates and miss or hit latencies. The virtual address translation scheme, which includes the TLBs and page table walkers, also impacts performance due to the possibility of page faults and TLB misses. Then at a higher level, there are the host CPUs themselves, which can actually have significant impact on total performance if there are any kernels in your DNN that cannot be efficiently offloaded to the accelerator, which is more likely to happen in the field of machine learning where new, unusual, and unexpected algorithms are often developed for new networks. And finally, there is the operating system itself running on the host CPU and supporting the DNN workloads that must be accelerated. The operating system affects both the correctness and the performance of the DNN accelerator because it forces it to reckon with new kinds of memory protection, as well as with interrupts, context switches, and other unexpected events that may harm total throughput if they have not been accounted for. Above the system, we have a full programming and software stack that DNN accelerators must be able to interact with while preserving performance and energy efficiency. Some DNN accelerators allow users to program their accelerators using only high level APIs, such as TensorFlow or Onyx, which define the structure of the neural network, but do not necessarily define how it is to be offloaded. Others will allow programmers to call functions at a lower level, which offloads particular kernels, making them easier to integrate into new applications but harder for developers to program. And finally, some allow users full control over the hardware's configuration and its low level ISA, which allows dedicated developers to extract the maximum performance necessary, but which greatly increases the developer's cognitive burden. So where does Gemini sit upon the system and software stack? Well, unlike prior accelerator generators, Gemini allows users to evaluate this full space, as well as to tune the hardware accelerator itself. Prior accelerator generators cover only a subset of this space because they are usually trying to advance the state of the art in one particular corner of the space. But Gemini covers a superset of what they cover in order to provide architects with a comprehensive platform for their own design space exploration. Now, Gemini's hardware template is pretty flexible, but it always follows the pattern shown in the diagram here. First and foremost, there is the 2D spatial array at the heart of the accelerator, which performs matrix operations. The 2D array can be parametrized to support different data flows, 
and also to support different levels of connectivity so that both TPU-like systolic arrays and NVDLA-like parallel vector engines can be generated and compared for scalability and energy efficiency. Beyond that, Gemini adds support for non-matimal operations as well, with computational blocks for matrix additions in an accumulator or for transposes, activation functions, or for on-the-fly IMTACAL, which speeds up convolutional operations. Some of these computational blocks, like the on-the-fly IMTACAL block, are optional and can be optimized out at elaboration time by the architect. Gemini also has a local scratch pad from which it reads data. And this scratch pad is parametrized to support different capacities, banking strategies, and porting options. That local scratch pad reads and writes data to a global memory, which has its own cache and DRAM hierarchy, which can be parametrized by the architect. Gemini gets instructions from a host CPU, which can be configured to be in order, out of order, low cost, or high performance. To access the global memory, Gemini accelerators are equipped with virtual address translation mechanisms, such as a, such as a local TLB, whose size and hierarchy can also be tuned. Finally, the Gemini generator allows users to put as many of these accelerators and as many of these CPUs on an SOC as they wish, hooked up to whatever global cache hierarchy they want. Now, Gemini's programming model exposes all the different levels of the software stack that we discussed above. Programmers are given the choice to use high-level DNN representations, such as Onyx, or to use a hand-tuned C library with different popular kernels like Matmuls and Convolutions and uh, Maxpools, or to configure their accelerator directly at a very low level using direct ISA instructions. This allows programmers to implement their own kernels if the ones that we provide them are insufficient or are not optimized enough for their particular system configuration. Now, with Gemini, we can compare the performance of different system configurations. For example, we can investigate how the host CPU impacts performance when Gemini is running convolutional networks, where the host CPU is responsible for running the IMTACAL function, which modifies convolutions into matmals we can see that a more powerful out-of-order CPU in, can increase performance by about 2x across many different workloads. But if the cost of the more powerful CPU is too high, then we can also add an optional on-the-fly IMTACAL unit to the accelerator, as Gemini permits, in which case the CPU performance has almost no impact on end-to-end -end CNN performance on the accelerator. With the IMTACAL unit, we were able to achieve real-time or near real-time performance on a variety of different networks. We evaluated our performance on both vision and language applications. In particular, our accelerator achieved 50% of NVIDIA LACE performance on ResNet 50. However, with the recent changes this semester, after our paper was accepted, we improved performance even further so that we now achieve about 80% of NVIDIA LACE performance on real world workloads like ResNet 50. Now, this is all very well and good, but we didn't make Gemini in order to try to get the highest performance, but instead to gain insight into how different system components affect overall performance and efficiency. So to demonstrate how Gemini enables these kinds of full system investigations, we've prepared a number of case studies. In one case study, we investigated how Gemini's virtual memory translation scheme affected overall performance of DNN workloads. We configured Gemini to construct a two-level TLB hierarchy where every accelerator and CPU had its own private TLB, but each could fall back on one large shared TLB at the L2 level in case of misses. We also used Gemini's full system visibility to plot the TLB misses of a full end-to-end -end run of ResNet 50, which showed that the TLB pattern of DNN workloads is far burstier and reaches far higher miss rates than typical SEC workloads that people may be more familiar with. In fact, Gemini's TLB miss rate went over 30% in the worst case on a full end-to-end -end DNN inference. Afterwards, we made a sweep over different TLB sizes, both for the small private TLBs and the larger shared TLB. We found that the smaller private TLB had a much larger impact on total performance 
than the larger share TLB. In fact, adding only about a dozen entries to the private TLB was more helpful to overall performance than adding hundreds of entries to the shared TLB. Afterwards, we were able to use Gemini to experiment with low cost optimizations for our, virtu for our virtual address translation mechanism. We added a single entry L0 TLB to filter out consecutive TLB requests to the same page. And we found that it allowed us to reach near maximum overall performance even without any shared large L2 TLB at all. This implies that DNN workloads, even when heavily tiled, still exhibit a sufficiently high level of page locality to make this extra L0 TLB worth the cost. With Gemini, we were able to evaluate the virtual address translation performance to tune and sweep its parameters and make low cost optimizations to it while evaluating its effect upon full system end-to-end -end performance. We saw that full system components like the virtual address translation scheme can significantly impact performance outside of the spatial array and accelerator itself. We also carried out another case study where we attempted to find the optimal resource partitioning scheme for our SRAM memories in a multi-core system. Our SOC had private scratch pads for the accelerators, as well as a shared L2 cache that the accelerators and CPUs contended over. We wanted to see whether it was more helpful to add more SRAMs to the private memories or to save them for the shared memory instead. Now, when just a single core was running, we found that the total performance of our DNN workload was more sensitive to the private scratch pad size because the convolutional layers with their high arithmetic intensity benefited greatly from larger private scratch pads. However, in the dual core case, we found that the shared L2 was more important for overall performance because the residual layers now became a bottleneck on DNM performance. Residual layers need, uh, need to save layer outputs in fast memory for a long period of time before accessing them again. And with two cores running simultaneously, there was simply too much contention over L2 space for these inputs unless the L2 space was enlarged. So Gemini, in this case, allowed us to evaluate the total impact of both SOC components, such as shared caches and multi-core configurations, as well as DNN layer composition upon overall performance. Gemini gave us insight into the overall performance implications of different parts of the hardware software system stack. So in conclusion, Gemini is a full system, full stack DNN accelerator generator that aims to enable DSC and co-design across the full hardware system and software stack. We are open sourced and we welcome new users. Thank you all for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, such a detailed, wonderful presentation. And Hasan, I, I know it, it takes a lot of uh, time and efforts to summarize the work done by about 15, 20, uh, you know, great researchers in short 15, 20 minutes. So thank you so much. And, and, and uh, uh, I should appreciate that you being with us at middle of your night. So Thanks to uh, you know your kind presence as well. So we have a huge set of questions already lined up for you, but in the interest of time, I'm I'm gonna pick a few of them. The very first curious question, and I would also like to know why the name Gemini. Oh well, um, that was somebody named Alon in our group, who, who's also on the authors list, came up with that name. Um, so it's it's a pun. Gemini is the name of a constellation. But I think it's also the name of a rocket which went into space. So it's normally spelled with one M, but we added another M because initially we were only planning to accelerate uh, matrix multiplications, and Gem is a common name for a matrix multiplication. Oh, uh, yeah. that's that's, that's nice. nice. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you. Thank thanks, Hassan. So the next question in line is uh, about the performance evaluation. So uh, yeah. would you like to provide a little more insight, uh, like what uh, what all uh, kind of, you know, I would say bottlenecks, uh, people are more curious to know about the bottlenecks you so, so folks don't, folks are not interested to know what went well, but they want to know what 
what was you know the bottleneck what was not uh, going well for you guys so would you like to uh, explain us briefly yeah um there are a few uh like types of kernels where gemini still like has areas for improvement which was just mm -hmm. a nice one bottleneck in our applications mm -hmm. um for example with convolutions one uh source of inefficiency with we have with cnns is that we don't overlap residual additions with convolutions right now uh, but we expect if we did that, we would get like another 10% maybe on some that works like rest than 50. Um, we also, for convolutions, have lower performance when the number of input channels is pretty low uh, because we paralyze over input channels. Uh, so that, that's something we've optimized a bit as well, but there's still some more work to be done there. On um, applications like BERT, like, you know, newer, uh, maybe more exciting, like transformer networks, um, where we, we have like... Um, we have like undergrads on our team who are working on optimizing Gemini for like those newer types of workloads. Um, but, but there's still some kernels within those workloads we don't support very well, like uh, like soft access, for example. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, people who are trying to add integer versions of that. Um, so, so, you know, like uh, there's like a collection of individual kernels where we, we sometimes fall back on the CPU, for example, uh, but we're working on improving those. Does that yeah. answer? Mm -hmm. No, no, so that, that gives a good uh, insight about uh, uh, the next question I could uh, read out is that, can you share more specifications of L0 TLB case study? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we kind of explained everything we kind of did there. Um, <laughs> there wasn't much more to it than what we described. We kind of... Um, so, so with Gemini, we basically just constructed hardware for lots of different TLB configuration sizes mm -hmm. in parallel. Um, and, and Gemini has certain counters that can be used to calculate like the, the misperformance over time. Um, then we instantiated all of these different uh, configurations on uh, basically FPGAs in the cloud. Um, and then we ran all of them on those FPGA workloads and like like a environment, like a like a Linux environment, where like mm -hmm. each each uh, FPGA was also running Linux on top of it, right? So we were trying to do like realistic, I guess, workloads, um, rather than just uh, simpler bare metal workloads. Um, yeah, so so we ran all of them in parallel. Uh, we uh, we 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 tried to use our counters to find, uh, you know, why. Um, the TLB mattered, uh, for example, whether whether it was preventing like the DMA from doing something or whether it was causing the L2 to, uh, to, um, to uh, stall. Um, usually it was just because it would cause the DM or, or accelerator's DMA to stall uh, because uh, it was just waiting for addresses to come back so it could make more requests. Um, but, but yeah, there, there wasn't that much more than what we described in the paper for that study, I think. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you. Thanks, Hassan. And, and so the, the list of question is really, really huge. <laughs> but in the interest of time, I would pick up another question. And I think we should be of a good uh, benefit of the audience. Uh, you mentioned at the end that it's an open source. Yeah. Okay. So if someone wants to go and utilize this open source, how do, uh, where, where they can find out, you know, more details, how do they go for it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so our, uh, if you go to our GitHub page, we have a quick start guide there mm -hmm. uh, that you should be able to do with, with purely open source software. Um, we recently also had a tutorial at uh, IASWC a few months mm -hmm. ago, mm -hmm. and we're uh, hoping to have another tutorial um, maybe this year um, at uh, MLSIS. Um, so, so, so people can watch our old, uh, watch our, you know, quick start guide and our old, old tutorial right now, but hopefully in a few months, we'll have a, a newer tutorial where we do, we talk about some of the newer scripts and, and features that we've added as well. Uh, but, but if any of it, you know, since it's open source, you know, like we, we welcome like, uh, issues that people find. So if anybody finds an issue with it or something that's confusing, they can, they can email me or they can post an issue on our GitHub page and we'll try to, uh, resolve those issues because we'd like other people to use this platform. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan. And uh, 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 thanks for providing us such deep insight. And uh, 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 whenever it is open source, uh, I really feel good about it. And we need more <laughs> of more, more and more of this happening. And uh, 
the way it is being conceptualized uh, by Berkeley and MIT, the, the, the two pioneer uh, institution uh, in the technology domain, and uh, then you know, um, uh, you know, giving it open, uh, you know, keeping it open to everyone is a, is a great initiative. So kudos to you. So with this, uh, let me uh, give you a big thanks uh, on behalf of the VLSA Design Conference uh, and many congratulations for winning this uh, very well-deserved award at DAC, okay? And a special thanks for you being uh, live with us mid of your night. Uh, uh, thank you for spending out your time and uh, you know uh, be, uh, bringing in a good value add to the VLSA Design Conference. So I wish you a good night. Thank you again so much. And uh, with this, let me... Uh, you know, move on the next paper uh, presentation for the day. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys so much, Brad. Great. So now it's time uh, to move to the next paper uh, for today evening. The paper is uh, 4.a.2. And the title of the paper is A Compute in Memory Architecture Compatible with a 3D NAND Flash that Parallel Activates Multi Layers. So very exciting topic. Uh, and the authors for this uh, paper presentation are Liang Zhou, Chun Yuan, Fan Yang, Shifan Gao Yi Zhao from Nishing University, China, along with uh, Garbel Dan Zingo from Hefrid Reliance Memory Limited, China. So I would request. Uh, coordinators to uh, bring in the next presenter on the stage, please. Hi, everyone. This is Liang Zhao from Zhejiang University. Today, it's my great pleasure to present our paper entitled, A Computing Memory Architecture Compatible with 3D NAND Flash that Parallelly Activates Multi-Layers. This work is in collaboration with Hefei Reliance Memory Limited. Here is the overview of my talk today. First, I will give a brief introduction on the background and motivation. Next, I will present a novel NAND-based computing memory or SIM architecture featuring parallel activation, including the mathematical formulations, the architecture and the peripheral circuits design, and some improvement techniques. In the next section, I will demonstrate how the proposed parallel activation scheme for 3D NAND SIM is verified by a combination of TCAD and SPI simulations. Finally, I will reveal the system level benchmarks before concluding this talk. First, I'd like to introduce some background. Nowadays, various neural network models are wildly popular for AI applications. These models share an origin deeply rooted in and inspired by the human brain. As we know, the brain computes and memorizes in a massively parallel fashion with the help of a large amount of neural cells interconnected with even more synapses. The neural network model can be viewed as a mathematical abstraction of such biological systems in which the vector matrix multiplication or VMM operation often consumes a majority of the computing resources. Aimed at accelerating the VMM operation, a canonical formulation for CIM has been proposed based on the cross-point array architecture. In this formulation, the input vector can be translated to voltages and fed into the array in parallel. At each cross point in the array, a memory cell can be used to encode the weights in neural networks and generate output current on the output line based on the input voltage. Then the currents from multiple input lines can be accumulated and sensed to get the calculation results of VMM. The input vector can be reused across many output lines. So the time complexity of this operation can be significantly reduced compared to the traditional computers with von Neumann architecture. Nowadays, researchers are quite familiar with this canonical formulation that applies to RM, MRAM, NOR flash, etc. Then why are we interested in 3D NAND? What's the motivation for studying 3D NAND based SIM? Here, the table compares some major memory technologies. Compared to SRAM, DRAM, and NOR, 3D NAND is a clear winner in terms of storage capacity, bit density, and cost. This image shows the famous 
Cerebra's wafer scale engine in which the entire wafer is one chip. This 12 inch wafer is able to deliver 40 gigabyte on chip SRAM for AI computing. However, this is still nothing compared to 3D NAND flash density. Think about it. If we can utilize 3D NAND to do in-memory computing, much larger models can all be stored on one chip at a much smaller fraction of the wafer area. Sounds cool, isn't it? Previously, there are already some studies to utilize 3D NAND to accelerate vector matrix multiplication. As far as we know, all of them are based on the layer by layer approach, which means only one word line plane is activated at a time. All others unselected word lines are exerted a bypass voltage. This way, it's just like a cross point array in the two dimensional plane. And regardless of the output direction, they are essentially the same as the canonical formulation. And we can see this per layer approach has very low utilization ratio of the NAND array. For 128 layers 3D NAND, for example, you can only utilize one over 128 of the cells each time. With these motivations in mind, we'd like to outline the major contribution of this work. In this work, we are the first to propose a 3D NAND based SIM architecture that parallelly activates multiple word line planes. This approach can achieve significant improvement of array utilization rate and energy consumption with commercial 3D NAND flash architecture and offers very attractive unit area energy efficiency. We also presented an innovative linear VT correction technique, which can significantly boost the computing accuracy. And finally, the NAND version of the positive negative weights technique can help to achieve four bit per cell storage. Next, let me introduce the proposed NAND-based SIM architecture with parallel activation, starting from some mathematical derivations. Here we use no flash based SIM as a reference to derive the NAND-based scheme. In the canonical formulation, at each cross point, there's a rewritable memory device which can be implemented as a floating gate transistor, for example. With proper pulse algorithms, the conductivity of this no flash cell can be continuously adjusted to represent multi-bit weight data. To derive the NAND-based scheme, we can look for the duality between NOR and NAND. As shown here, in the NOR-based formulation, the cell organization is parallel with respect to the output line. The summation method is current summation and weight encoding is achieved in terms of conductance. Thus, we can arrive at the fundamental equation for NOR-based SIM, which is I equals input V times conductance and then summation. Following this logic, we can derive the NAND-based SIM scheme, which implies serial organization of cells with respect to the output, voltage summation method, and the weight data should be encoded as a resistance. Now the fundamental equation for SIM should be V equals to input I times resistance then summation. We shall design our new SIM scheme around this equation. To do this, we can design an operation scheme so that a sensing current is applied to a string of NAND flash. And the output can be measured as the voltage accumulated across the entire string. To evaluate how to perform multiplication, we can first assume all flash cells work in the linear region and write down the current equation for the floating gate transistor. Here, the threshold voltage VT is programmable and everything else is similar to a normal transistor. Recall that the weights should be encoded as resistance and assume the transistor is in deep linear region. So VG minus VT is much larger than VDS. We can calculate the approximate source string resistance as shown here. In this expression, C is a constant that is only dependent on the fabrication process. And during the inference operation, VG is also a constant voltage biased to the gate. Thus, we can program the threshold voltage VT to encode the weight data. This way, the output voltage can be written as sensing current times the sum of resistances of every flash cell in the NAND string. And note, this form is exactly the fundamental equation for NAND-based SIM. Now our task is to design a representation scenario for VT pro programming and the input voltages. 
so that the output voltages for all input and weight combinations yield the correct results for VMM operations. This table demonstrates one such example. The philosophy is to design the input voltage and the program VT so that the output resistance or one over VG minus VT is only large when both input and weight is one. In all other cases, the output resistance should be smaller so that a much smaller voltage is accumulated on the bit line. Recall that in the canonical formulation with RM or MRAM, the on-off ratios are also finite. So we think this new scenario should work just fine. It's worth mentioning that this kind of scenario only realizes binary input and weights. And later we will discuss how to achieve multi-bit weights. Now let's take a look at the 3D NAND SIM architecture based on computation scenario and its peripheral circuit design. Some of the benefits of our proposed NAND-based scheme are outlined here, including compatibility with commercial 3D NAND flash and the possibility to utilize all layers at the same time. This figure on the right shows a typical array architecture of commercial 3D NAND flash. Note that for each block, there is a few upper select gates, often four of them, and many, many bit lines. The control gates of all flash memories in one word line plane are connected together in one block. Since the number of bit lines in one block is huge, one potential limitation here could be the number of available voltage sensing ADCs. In order to overcome this limitation, we have designed a voltage adder with active resistor to add the volt voltages from multiple bit lines. This way, we don't need to sense and save a lot of the partial sums and the ADC bottleneck can be relaxed. The key enabler of this design is an active resistor made up of three transistors. It utilizes feedback loop to help stabilize the resistance across input voltages and the output resistance is a function of the biasing current. Now we'd like to compare the new approach with the conventional layer by layer activation, assume 64 or 128 layer commercial 3D NAND flash, the proposed parallel activation scheme can increase the array utilization by 16 to 32 times. Moreover, there's no major changes in terms of power because in both cases, the read voltage and current are similar for each NAND string. This means the same power that performs one multiplication in the layer by layer approach can now accomplish 64 or 128 multiply and add. Now that the parallel activation scheme clearly offer great benefits, let's talk about some imperfections and further improvements. In the above analysis, we have assumed that each transistor works in the deep linear region. However, when the NAND string is long, this assumption may break down. This is because if we move along the bit line, the source voltages of flash cells keep increasing due to the accumulated output voltage. And this elevated source voltage will push the transistors towards the saturation region. We can illustrate this using the IDVD curves of transistors. During the VMM operation, the NAND string is biased at a constant current. When the source voltage is elevated, the effective VGS is reduced and the operating point will be moving towards the right side. Ultimately, it will move out of the linear region and the computing scheme will collapse. In order to compensate this error, we propose a linear compensation of VT using the simulated mean value of each transistor's source voltage. This compensation is applied to the programmed VT of flash cells so that the input VG levels can be kept the same. Up to this point, all the discussions are based on binary weight storage or one bit per cell. Next, we'd like to discuss how to achieve multi-bit weight storage with a NAND version of the positive negative weights technique as shown in this table. Following a similar der derivation as a binary case, Multi-bit storage can be achieved by programming VT so that one over VG minus VT plus minus one over VG minus VT minus exhibits multiple levels and follows a linear relationship versus the expect, expected output. This way we can subtract the accumulated voltages on the positive and negative bit lines to obtain the correct results for VMM. 
Note, this is very difficult to achieve with only one bit line because non-uniform distribution of VT levels will be required. In the next section, we'd like to verify the feasibility and the accuracy of the proposed NAND-based SIM with parallel activation. Here, we first refer to some previous studies which calibrates a TCAD model from the experimental data. Using TCAD, we can simulate the IV curves for a wider range of device dimensions and bias conditions from which the parameters can be extracted for a SPICE model. Since we'd like to verify the output voltages for all possible combinations of input and weights, the SPICE level simulation is the proper method. This page demonstrates the TCAD model for a 3D NAND string with 10 flash cells in serial with the important geometry parameters outlined. With the help of TCAD simulations, we can then generate a series of device electrical data and extract the SPICE model parameters. Here, we use the BSIM CMG model to do the extraction and the results suggest a good match with TCAD simulations. With the calibrated SPICE model and the operation scheme of table two, we first simulated a NAND string with 10 flash cells connected in serial with 1,024 possible inputs and 1,024 possible weight. There are 1 million possible input weight combinations and all of them were simulated. The results suggest that all 11 output levels can be fully separated in terms of bit line voltage. However, the separation margin is not very large in some cases. With the linear VT compensation, the linearity and level separation of the output are significantly improved. This proves that linear VT compensation is very effective. Next, we simulated the multi-level weight storage scheme using positive and negative weights technique. Using the proposed four bit per cell scenario, we simulated all 256 input weight combinations for one pair of cells. The results suggest that the voltages of 17 expected outputs are well separated and linearly distributed, indicating four bit per cell capability. Now we have studied the NAND based scheme using a 10 cell string. It is important to further evaluate the scheme with a realistic 3D NAND string, say 64 or 128 layers. For 64 layer 3D NAND, since it's not possible to simulate two to the power of 128 combinations of input and weight data, we carefully st studied the simulation results from two cell strain to 10 cell strain. We found that the voltage minimum and maximum at each expected output always exhibit certain pattern. So the same patterns can be applied to study 64 cell strain. Here, we demonstrate the simulation results for the 64 cell NAND string. Without the compensation, we can see there's significant voltage overlap between adjacent output levels and the precision will be quite low. On the other hand, with linear VT compensation, the output levels demonstrate very good lin linearity and level separation, which is sufficient to support a four bit input, four bit weight and five bit ADC design, which is common in quantization studies. The linear VT correction techniques is again confirmed to be critical for the practical application of NAND-based SIM. Finally, we'd like to introduce some system level benchmark results to see how the proposed scheme works with practical deep neural network models. First, we explore the mapping strategy for convolutional neural networks into a 3D NAND array. The conclusion is that a preferable scenario is to divide the kernel data into one dimensional slices in its depth direction and map each slice into one separate block of the 3D NAND array. Different kernels data can be mapped along the warline direction of the same block. This way, during the VMM operation, we can add the bit line voltage from multiple blocks using the voltage adder and directly get the output feature map, which prevents the buffering of numerous intermediate partial sums. Next, we benchmarked the performance of the 3D NAND based SIM against some other existing computing memory technologies. Here, we used the NeuroSIM package developed by Georgia Tech and uh, applied the ResNet 18 model. The results suggest that in terms of unit area energy efficiency, 
the 3D NAND-based SIM exhibits 300x improvement from SRAM and the 15x improvement from RM FEFAT at the same technology node. We can further break down the en energy consumption into the ADC, the accumulation, and the peripheral portions across all layers of the network. Compared to the RM case, we can see that the peripheral energy consumption is similar since the network structure is not changed. However, the ADC and accumulation steps consume much less energy due to the highly efficient multiply and add achieved by 3D NAND. This confirmed our, our expectation of significant read power reduction. Since binary operation is assumed here, we further expect the energy efficiency to improve with four bit per cell waste storage. Finally, I'd like to conclude my talk. We have proposed a novel 3D NAND based SIM architecture featuring parallel activation of multiple layers. The innovative linear VT correction and positive weight negative weights techniques help to improve the accuracy and the efficiency in practical applications. The results indicate significant improvement of array utilization rate and read power consumption for DNN inference applications. Thank you very much for your kind attention. This is the end of my talk today. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the great overview uh, on this uh, compute in memory architecture, which is you know need of the hour. Uh, so we are moving more and more closer to edge, or rather I would say we want to be at the edge uh, most of the time. We want to do the compute in no time and uh, we want the best of the results in the you know least of the time consuming you know minimum of the power so that there's the need of the r for all of the gadgets uh, we see in uh, you know this in memory compute uh, techniques and technologies are certainly you know, the way forward so thank you so much uh, for providing this good overview about the parallel nand based cima architecture talking talking about the uh, mathematical formulation of this NAND based CIM. And then, you know, talking about the peripheral design, how do we do improvement in the linearity and MLC storage, uh, uh, you know, well captured by you. And finally, uh, you know, you gave a good, uh, good summary of the verification uh, for the proposed uh, parallel activation methodology. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the conclusion uh, on the system benchmark, uh, the all benchmark studies uh, done by you is really appreciable. So this is a really uh, great fine piece of work. So thank you so much uh, for your time today to come and present this amongst us. Uh, and, and I think we are not doing that great on the time side. So with this, we'll skip Q&A in the interest of time and we'll move forward uh, with the next presentation, uh, which is presentation 4.a.3. and. Uh, the title of this uh, paper is DNN optimization and RL inspired optimization for analog circuit, circuit sizing using deep neural networks. And this paper is uh, being authored by Ahmad, David, and Nasun uh, from the University of Texas, Austin, Texas, along with Pratik Chandramuli, Chandramuli V. Kashyap from Intel Corporation and with Bolu from University of Glasgow, Glasgow United Kingdoms. So we have a, a, you know, uh, this good uh, collaboration um, among University of Texas, Intel and University of Glasgow. I, I'm, I'm pretty curious to know more about how you know, these analog circuit sizings are being done using deep neural networks. So I would uh, request team to come and uh, present your uh, work. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Ahmed Budak and welcome to the presentation for DNNOPT, which is an RL inspired optimization for analog circuit sizing using deep neural networks. Uh, our paper is a product of a joint work between the University of Texas at Austin and Intel Corporation. Well, to, to give it an introduction, uh, today's world is highly digital and the number of semiconductor built devices are increasing almost in a logarithmic scale. The advances in IoT applications, the new trends in the car industry, uh, devices for health and communication applications, they introduce a huge demand for IC devices. In fact, 
As of we are making this presentation, uh, the world is facing a severe chip shortage. It causes manufacturing pauses and disruptions in the consumer market. And we also want to highlight the importance of analog blocks in the IC design. Basically, any sensor related applications and real world interfaces, they require analog circuits, which makes the crucial part of the design flow of IC systems. An analog IC design comes with its own challenges. It is still heavily manual and iterative process. It also involves multiple steps where designer may loop back to previous steps many times in the process. Also, it becomes more and more challenging uh, with the scaling because long channel approximations do not hold anymore and it suffers from complex design rules and performance trade-offs. Well, combining this with the very competitive time to market requirements, uh, the need for automation tools in the design flow, it becomes more and more visible. Our work is mainly focusing on the sizing part of analog IC design flow. Uh, therefore, we will start with defining sizing problem. The assumption for the initial conditions is that uh, we have the circuit topology and the specification list to meet. Uh, we are also given some design parameters with range information. And if you want to depict sizing problem with an example, see that uh, we have a two stage differential OTA as the circuit topology. Uh, we have a specification list. Basically, we want to minimize the power while meeting other specs uh, which are coming from AC, DC or transient analysis. And the final element of initial conditions is the parameters. Uh, we have some transistor widths, lengths. Uh, we also have uh, resistor capacitor values with their possible ranges. And the mathematical correspondence for sizing problem would be the constraint optimization problem, uh, where we search for the optimal parameter vector x, which minimizes a function f, and it will be subject to multiple constraint functions g's. Uh, in order to tackle sizing problem, multiple methods have been proposed. Uh, there has been some model-free methods, such as genetic algorithms and simulated annealing. Uh, these methods in general are randomized global optimization algorithms, but uh, they are known for their sample inefficiency, uh, which is due to limited guidance in their search, basically. And then some model free algorithms are used in the sizing problem, such as Bayesian optimization and other hybrid models. Uh, by modeling the search space, these methods provide more sample efficiency, but they generally utilize Gaussian processes uh, as a regression model, and it suffers from computationally expensive operations. And also Bayesian optimization may stuck in the local optima uh, when there are high number of parameters and the problem is constrained. And lately reinforcement learning methods are introduced in the field. Uh, they provide competitive results due to powerful exploration ability, but uh, they require very large number of samples in order to train their agents. Well, our work, the NNOPT, combines the goods of these methods uh, it's a population-based method, and the convergence to the global optimal point is searched by this population. And we also control the exploration noise using this population. Our method also utilizes a, a two-stage deep neural network. Well, one network provides modeling of the function space, and the other network guides the search. Uh, to pipeline the two-stage network, we borrowed some ideas from IAL community and we tailored them for the optimization task. And finally, uh, our algorithm utilizes a critical device identification method, and we use sensitivity, sensitivity analysis for this. Uh, by using sensitivity analysis, we are able to use our method in uh, large-scale circuits with thousands of devices. The overall picture of our work is as shown. Uh, we basically start with taking the circuit topology, the design specs, and some parameter information. And then we combine the NNOPT with a circuit simulator. And the output of the final optimization would be the optimal design parameters. 
that uh, most closely meeting the specs given at the beginning. Uh, this is how the Nanopt looks inside. Uh, this is the flow the algorithm follows during each iteration in the optimization loop. Uh, say that in iteration T, we have a set of designs XT and their circuit performances FXT. We take these samples and we create pseudo samples out of them. We will explain how and why we create these pseudo samples. Just for now, assume they are the final data we use to train our two stage deep neural networks. So we first use these pseudo samples to train a network which behaves like a proxy to the circuit simulator. We will call this network critique network. Uh, when we complete training critique network, we will train the second network, which will allow us to find the next sample point in the optimization. And we call this network actor network. Uh, to find the next sample, we will use actor network in the inference mode. And we will also use the information uh, coming from the current population. And then we will determine the noise amount for exploration. Well, then we use the circuit simulator to get a function evolution for the next sample. And the new sample set and new function evaluations are used to repeat this loop. Now we will go more into details. Uh, assume that we have an initial sample set which consists of some design X and their evaluations FX. In our algorithm, we require two networks, namely actor and critique networks. The input to the critique network is a design vector X and the change vector delta X. And the output is the performance approximations for the design. So what critique tells me is that if I take a design X and change it by delta X, what would my spec values be? And the actor network takes a initial, takes a design X and it outputs the changes in each design parameter, the delta X vector. So if we are to describe how actor network would behave in the most ideal case, it would take an underperforming design with parameters X and suggest such delta X's to that design so that we have a new design perfectly meeting our specs. But this is not possible since the best actor can do is limited by the information we saved in the critique network. So critique models the function space and actor searches for the optimal point inside the fixed critique network. Well, at this point, we want to clarify why we are modeling critique based on X and delta X pairs instead of X or X plus delta X directly. Uh, we have a toy example here, uh, which is an inverter with two parameters and a delay spec. So we have some practical reasons for modeling the critique network via X and delta X pairs instead of X directly. So first is that uh, we can generate the pseudo samples by using the pairs created by the Cartesian product of the initial samples. And by this way, using n initial samples, we can create n square pseudo samples. We also know that both X and delta X is relevant to the performance, so we are not introducing dummy parameters. So this methodology allows us to square the number of data for training, which is very crucial for neural network performance. And Basically, the only cost of doing this is the linear increase in the number of learning weights in the network. Also on the benchmark problems, we experimentally verified that uh, using pseudo samples instead of the original samples consistently increased increase the optimization performance. Now we will explain how, how we train our actor and critique networks. Uh, remember that we want critique network to approximate and generalize for our specs. The critique network has input dimensionality of 2D, where D is the number of design parameters, and it has output dimensionality of K, where K is the number of specs. Uh, to train critique network, we start with uh, initial database of n samples, and we generated n squared pseudo samples, resulting in x and delta x pairs in the input dimension. And this data is then used to train the network, since uh, we want to minimize the difference between the critique output and the real simulation output, 
we calculate the mean squared error between the network output and real simulation value and we use it as the loss expression for training. And in this slide we will explain how we can train the actor network. Uh, in this phase we assume we already trained the critique network meaning that we have a proxy for the real simulations and we will use this fixed critique to train actor. Uh, remember that actor will take a design with parameter x and it will propose changes for those parameters which is delta x. Then we use critique to evaluate the performance of x delta x pair which was created by the actor. Assume that uh, for now we are only interested in uh, meeting our specs. In such case uh, we can simply use the total constraint violation amount as the loss expression. The idea is that uh, as we train the actor network, it will learn to propose better and better delta x's, which result in smaller loss values, which in turn means smaller constraint violations based on critique's output. We would like to present some result statistics with the experiments we conducted. Uh, this set of experiment is run on the two conventional analog block. Uh, we compared our algorithm with uh, three different methods. One is differential evolution, which is a model-free method. Uh, the second is Bayesian optimization for constraint optimization. And the third is GASPAT, uh, which is a hybrid model-based method. The statistics presented here are from 10 independent runs. Uh, the experiments show that DNNOPT is the only method that successfully find, finds the feasible design for each circuit and each run. Uh, the NNOPT also has high efficiency, both in number of simulations used and the time consumed for modeling. Uh, we also realized that uh, given the same simulation budget, the NNOPT finds design with better objective. Also, we can visualize the optimization quality by defining a figure of merit based on the normalized constraint validations. Uh, we can see both plots show the NNOPT has better convergence behavior than the compared algorithms. The second experiment set is conducted in the company environment with larger designs. Uh, the experiment set only compared with a commercially provided optimizer which uses a simulated annealing. Uh, before running the experiments, uh, we run a sensitivity analysis on the circuits and determined critical devices. Then the optimization tasks are run based on the critical devices. Uh, in the large scale circuit experiments, the NNOPT was able to satisfy the designer provided specs for all test cases. And we can see it outperformed the commercial optimizer in terms of the total number, total simulation numbers required to find feasible designs. To conclude our work, we introduced a novel reinforcement learning inspired two-stage deep neural network for analog sizing problem. We included a pseudo sample generation method and training scheme for improved net network performance. Uh, we have demonstrated an extension for our work on large circuits via critical device identification. And finally, we have proven the high performance and efficiency of our method on both small and large scale circuits. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving your uh, deep insight uh, uh, about this good work uh, on, on log circuit uh, sizing using the deep neural networks. I'm really uh, excited uh, to see the time uh, when we are going to get all the stuff done by these deep neural networks okay at the same time i'm worried i'm uh, you know worried uh, and uh, you know about the jobs where uh, what what we have seen is uh, the moment we revolutionize uh, something you know we got to work on the more better more innovative things so thank you so much uh, for uh, all your uh, great summary uh, about the two stage um, dnn for analog sizing about the pseudo sample generation about you know extension of the large circuits via uh, circuital uh, device identification and uh, you know your high performance and efficiency uh, efficiency on the you know large scale circuit and i have seen uh, uh, you have captured a good number of uh, basic building blocks of analog ips uh, to explain your uh, theories okay so with this uh, let's move forward to the 
last paper of the today's session, which is paper uh, 4.a.4. For, and, and the paper title is NAAS, which is Neural Accelerator Architecture Search. And this paper is authored by uh, Yujun Lin Song Han from Magister Institute of Technology, Cambridge, and Mingting Yang from Shanghai Jiotong University, Shanghai, China. So uh, I would request team to uh, bring up the last uh, presentation of the, the session of this evening today on the screen now. Hello, everyone. I am very glad to introduce our recent work on Neural Accelerator Architecture Search. My name is Yujun Li, and I am a PhD student at MIT. As the rapid development and deployment of deep learning, accelerating deep learning computing has received lots of interest. Both neural architecture and accelerator architecture design are important to enable the specialization and acceleration of deep learning applications. Given the huge design space, data-driven approach is desirable, where a new architecture design evolves as new designs and rewards are collected. Both hardware-aware neural architecture search and auto-compiler optimization are typical examples of data-driven approaches. However, this work only focuses on the off-the-shelf hardware and neglect the freedom in the hardware design space. Neural architecture and accelerated architecture co-design covers three aspects, designing the neural network, designing the accelerator, and designing the compiler that maps the model on the accelerator. Therefore, the overall design space can be categorized into three classes, accelerator space, including buffer sizes and array sizes, compiler space, including loop orders and tiling sizes, and neural network space, including the number of layers, the number of channels, and the kernel sizes. These design parameters deeply entangled with each other. As the table shows, the correlation between neural and accelerator architecture is complicated and varies from accelerator to accelerator. For instance, tiled input channels should be the multiples of the number of rows of the compute array in NVIDIA Way, while the number of rows is related to the kernel size in IRIS. A tuple of perfectly matched neural architecture accelerated architecture and mapping strategy will improve the utilization of the computer array and on-chip memory, maximizing efficiency and performance. Given the large design space, it is challenging to achieve holistic optimization by human design. We propose the Neural Accelerated Architecture Search, NAAS. For a specific workload, the Accelerated Architecture Search and NAS are conducted in one optimization loop to get tailored hardware and tailored neural network. We first look into accelerator architecture design space. It can be categorized into two classes, architectural sizing, such as the number of PEs and buffer size, and connectivity parameters, such as array dimensions and inter-PE connections. Existing framework usually focuses on the architecture sizing, which are numerical values and can be easily embedded into vectors. On the other hand, P connectivity is difficult to be encoded as vectors. Moreover, changing the connectivity requires redesigning the compiler mapping strategies. Therefore, our first step is to search accelerator design and compiler mapping at the same time. But how to embed these dimensions as vectors? We first investigate the loop nest of convolution, which can be divided into two parts, temporal mapping and spatial mapping. Loop tiling and loop order is reflected in the temporal mapping, and the spatial mapping can be inferred from the parameter. Here, the PE connectivity can be modeled as the choice of parallelism. For example, two parallel dimensions indicate a 2D array. Parallelism in input channels means a reduction connection of the partial sum accumulation register inside each PE. Parallelism in output channels means a broadcast to input feature register inside each PE. The selection of dimensions and loop ordering can be represented by the predefined index value. Hence, P connectivity can be represented by limited number of numerical values, 
hardware encoding vector contains two parts, architectural sizing and connectivity parameters. And the mapping encoding vector contains multiple parts, including loop orders of PE level and loop tiling for the array dimension level. After embedding the accelerated design and comparator strategy into vectors, we can apply machine learning algorithms to automatically search the architecture. Here, we choose the CMA evolution strategy algorithm. We first random sample accelerator candidates based on the normal distribution to form a population. Each accelerator candidate and neural network benchmark determine its unique mapping search space. We randomly sample the mappings based on the normal distribution, similar to the accelerator architecture search. A pair of mapping candidate and hardware candidate is then fed into hardware evaluation backend to get the energy delay product as a reward. Here we use Miastro as our evaluation backend. It is easy to generalize to other backends too. For example, we are going to support time loop soon. We then select the best mapping fits according to the EDP rewards and update the mean and variance of the sample normal distribution to increase the likelihood near the best fits. We then repeat the sample evaluation, selection, update distribution process. When reaching the predefined efforts, the final best mapping for the given accelerator candidates will survive. The energy delay product reward is then used to select the best accelerator fits in the accelerator population. We similarly update the accelerator sample distribution to increase the likelihood around the best accelerator fits. We then repeat sample accelerator, find the best mapping for the accelerator candidates, select the best accelerator fits, update the sample distribution process. Finally, we will get the best accelerator design and its corresponding mapping strategy. However, there are non-numerical design parameters in our research space, including parallel dimension selection and loop ordering. During the experiment, we found that using index to directly encode the parallel dimension and loop orders does not work well. It is because that the increment and the decrement of the indexes does not convey any physical information. To solve this problem, we propose the important based encoding method. We first fix the dimension position in the vector. For example, the first value represents the k dimension here, and the second value represents the c dimension, etc. During the sampling, each dimension is assigned with an importance value by the optimizer. For example, for parallel dimension selection, optimizer gives k dimension with an importance of 4 and c dimensions of importance of 6. We then sort the importance value in decreasing order. For parallel dimension selection, we use the first k dimension in the hardware encoding vector as the parallel dimension as a kd compute array. Here, dimension c and k have the largest importance and thus they are chosen as the parallel dimensions of a 2D compute array. For loop ordering, the dimensions with the highest importance in the mapping encoding vector will become the outermost loop, while the one with the lowest importance will be placed at the innermost in the loop nest. Along with other information in the embedding vectors, we can construct the computation loop nests. This strategy is interpretable. Since the importance value represents the data locality of the dimension, the dimension labeled as the most important has the best data locality since it is the outermost loop, while the dimension labeled as the least important has the poorest data locality, therefore it is the innermost loop. We evaluate an AS with four hardware resource constraints, HTBU, OVDLA, IRIS, and CDNL on two sets of CNN benchmarks, including classic large-scale networks, such as VGG16 and ResNet50, and lightweight mobile networks, such as MobileNet V2 and SqueezeNet. As learning curve shows, the average energy delay product of candidates' pools is decreasing during the NAS optimization, while it stays high in the random search baseline. NAS gradually improves the quality of the accelerated candidates. Compared to searching the architectural sizing only, 
Searching the connectivity and mappings at the same time achieves much better energy delay production. Furthermore, our NAS is able to consistently offer better solution within different hardware resources for different neural network benchmarks, providing up to 16 times speed up and six times energy savings. Thanks to the low search cost, we can integrate our framework with neural architecture search to achieve neural accelerator compiler co-design. First, NAS generates a pool of accelerator design candidates by random sample based on the sample distribution as before. For each accelerator candidate, we sample a network candidate from NAS framework, which satisfies the predefined accuracy requirement. Since each subnet of one's four network is well chained, the accuracy evaluation is fast. This network candidates will become the benchmark for NAS framework. Afterwards, for each network candidate, NAS will search the mappings to obtain the best energy delay product. Finally, the NAS will update the optimizer using the energy delay product reward of each pair of accelerated network candidates. In the evaluation of NAS integrated with NAS, the design space of NAS contains three width multiplier choices, 18 residual blocks at maximum, three reduction ratios in each residual block and a fine grain input image size choices. There are 10 to the 13 possible network candidates in our design space. Co-searching the accelerator design, compiler mapping, and neural network, we are able to achieve four times energy delay product improvement while providing 2.7% accuracy improvement. The final hardware data flow design prioritizes the output height and output channels dimension, which is very different from the classical Shidiana. NVIDIA way TPU and Iris architecture design. Furthermore, compared to previous work NAS8, which searches architecture sizing only, our NAS not only provides better accelerated design, but also requires less searching cost. Inferencing the same network searched by NAS8, NAS outperforms NAS8 by 1.8 times energy delay product improvement. As a conservative estimation, NAS saves more than 120 times the search cost compared to NAS8 or ImageNet. To sum up, design space of hardware compiler and neural networks are tightly entangled. Joint optimization is better than separate optimization. We should optimize both numerical parameters and non-numerical parameters, such as P, connectivity, and loop order. Important-based encoding helps optimize non-numerical parameters. Our NAS offers a one-button solution to co-designing the neural networks, accelerator hardware, and mapping strategies. For more information, please visit our website at tinyml.mit.edu. Thank you so much for listening. Great. Thank you so much uh, for the detailed uh, explanation about the NAS, the Neural Accelerator Architecture Search. Mm -hmm.